Sure. Okay. Danielle, I want to welcome everyone to the March meeting of this Manhattan Community Board One Transportation and Street Activity Permit Committee meeting. Um, I'm joined by Michael Francoeur, the co-chair. I'm Betty Kay, the chair of the committee. And Lucian Reynolds, our district manager, will be here acting as host. Michael will be helping with the slides. Let's go to the next slide. The agenda is relatively short tonight. Uh, we only have three items. We're going to start off with Jennifer Leung from the DOT. She's going to talk to us a little bit about the 2021 CAPA regulatory agenda. To go to the next slide. Those of you who really love details, the City Administrative Procedure Act, which is the CAPA, uh, is what establishes the procedure. These, we're talking about the rules. And these are the DOT's rules. So I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer so we can learn a little more. Let's go to the next slide. Some questions. But hopefully we can get answered. And Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Betty. Uh, and Thank you. Board one. Um, my name is Jennifer Liam, due to my Board Commissioner's Office. Um, I'll just go through each one. Um, so with the rulemaking process at DOT, we pretty much, DOT follows the uh, the CAPA itself, which is outlined in the section um, 1041, which is part of the New York City Charter. Um, a lot of this is actually on also the New York Rules website. Um, I will send the link in a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, simply we just follow, you know, what, you know, what CAPA you know, and, uh, dictates to us. Then um, with the, uh, what, what it is uh, for this agenda is that um, it's uh, published uh, every year around May. So the one that uh, that you shared with us was actually May of 2020. And this is actually found on the city records uh, uh, webpage. Um, DOT is currently working on its uh, fiscal year 22 uh, CAP agenda, which will be published later this year. And it's also going to be around the same time in May. Um, when it comes to uh, the public input uh, for the rule changes before they are finalized, there is a 30-day uh, comment period where any member of the public can review and comment on the agency's uh, proposed rules. Uh, this can be found on the proposed rule changes which is also part of the um, the rules website. So uh, maybe now I should just send the uh, the link to it. Hold on. Yeah, please do, because none of them were listed there. Hold on. It's rules.cityofnewyork.us. So it's Really, it's pretty simple, but where's my chat number? But yeah, um, that's pretty much uh, what I have for now when it comes okay, to yeah, uh, the agenda. Is there any way of finding out because for the list for this year, 2021, which I know we're kind of in the middle of it since the way the fiscal year is different than the calendar year, any way of knowing when those rules have been finalized or are having commentary because how do we even know when to comment or so i think what happens is that under the city record there is a, a list of proposed rules um when we have these proposed rules they always end up um we always end up having a hearing about them so with the hearing i think uh you know the hearing is usually hosted by dot itself and um you know the public can either uh, send in written comments or they actually can, um, I think, attend in person, but maybe with COVID going on, I don't think that's the case. But um, I do see some of the, you know, some of the other agencies, how they have certain um, proposed rules that, you know, have been, you know, listed on that uh, city records list. Yeah, because I looked, because there weren't any DOT rules, and I was wondering if they were ever sent out to the community boards or what's the best way we could do it because I guess we're missing them all. Um, I think it's something that you could always check through city record, or I think maybe there's a way that I can also make sure I, you know, when I get that information, then I pass it on to the community board. That would be very helpful if DOT would just pass it out when they're posting. Okay. 
because for me, like, I know there's a few in the past that I made aware of. And I think when I, when I am aware of them, I end up sending to the community boards and, you know, elected officials and everyone else, but not, I don't think, um, I don't get all of them. Because some of them are, I guess, they're citywide. I guess when they are more geared towards, like, I guess, for CD1 or down in the area that I cover, then I end up getting the notifications of, from straight from our uh, legal team. Uh, Lucian, what do you say about the best way for us to get them? Because there are many that are very relevant, probably to all community boards, but certainly to ours. Well, the city record, they're published in the city record. The good thing about the city record is they've moved towards a much more nimble, responsive uh, way of providing notice. So if you, I think if you go to the city record, you can, you can have it notify you when certain things are updated. I mean, the city record is used for so many things. Notice about RFPs and contracts and, 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 you know, uh, proposed rules and hearings and all that, but, um, you can do more with the city record than ever. It used to just be you have to, you know, page through uh, a you know, monthly compendium, but it's it's different now. So that would be the first thing I recommend is everyone just get to know the the online version of the city record, and I'll 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 find the link and put it up. Um, the second thing is uh, take a look at this rules site, rules.cityofnewyork.us. Um, this is also. Um, an important thing to to to, to look at. Um, I do not know how well it notifies you uh, and how um, granular you can get. You can say, you know, notify me if this agency um, uh, uh, updates its rules. Uh, in fact, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it can't do that, but it is something that you can sort um, by agency. Uh, of what is a, a pending uh, rule change. Sometimes we do get notice of rule changes, but it's usually, you know, a much a very specific rule change. So, you know, sanitation is, you know, like Pat will remember uh, when sanitation is moving to a zone uh, pickup system. Uh, 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 that was something that, you know, was a very notable rule change that went through this process. But the DOT Kappa list is a very comprehensive con uh, uh, compendium of many, 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 many different rules uh, and uh, kind of all together. And so, you know, I, I guess I'm not super clear right now what, when things are posted to the DOT rules portal and then when they're just only posted to the city record. Is this a pre, is this a, and I may have missed this, but is this like a pre kind of notification that they'll move over to the rules portal? Uh, when that hearing period or the, the, the response period goes up, uh, or is, is this a separate process altogether, or maybe a little bit of both? That's something that I, I need to get more information on. I believe it's a little bit of both. I mean, I would say that what you see right now, this is probably something that they post up after they have the hearing. Because I think once you have the hearing, I think you have that 30, uh, 30 day comment period. You know what? Let me double check with my team on that one because I don't think I was clear on that myself. And what we're going to also do, you know, Betty, Betty, and I had a really great conversation with Tammy today. Um, it just seems like you know demystifying Kappa, you know, altogether for all agencies is really important. And so uh, Tammy's going to ask if the borough president can get someone to come in and uh, do a borough, borough board for all the Manhattan community boards. And do like an in-depth <clears throat> review of how Kappa works and what the city's responsibilities are, because um, looking for a good write-up of Kappa will only lead you to uh, continuing education courses for 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 this New York State Bar, you know. And that's you know that's not something that really is a good resource for community people or community board members or public members. So we'll want something that's really geared towards us. Um, but this is a good window into the world of rule changes that we have a lot more uh, 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 ground to cover. Uh, yes, and for the people listening who are wondering what kind of rules are you even talking about? Some of the rules being done in this fiscal year include things that I know 
quality of life has been interested in because of construction and some of the things I'm interested in because of accessibility around construction sites and other sites. Some of the things the bicycling community is interested in because it's can they make a right turn? Can they have do they have to stop at a T intersection? Uh, there are many things that one it would be good for all of us to know as citizens what the rules really are when they're changing. But some of these are things we've really been questioning. Can we fix this? Because it's a problem to us, such as making a work site safe for pedestrians. There are no standardized rules and they are going to create standardized rules. We thought it would be good to know about them and to be able to have some feedback during that 30 day period of time. So that's why we're talking about it. So stay tuned and we'll be looking for more. And thank you, Jennifer. That's very helpful. Because DOT is doing some interesting stuff this year. Yep. So I'm going to turn the floor. Are there any questions or comments? Because I'm not seeing any hands. If not, I will move on to item number two, which is Michael. It's going to talk back to the street use priorities. I will. Hopefully you're not sick of this conversation yet. Um, thank you so much for that. Oh, go ahead. Who's talking? No, I said loving them. <laughs> Thanks, Lucian. <laughs> He's our plant. <laughs> um, uh, I was going to say thank you for the, the uh, discussion to Jennifer Leung. Uh, I'm, I was not familiar with um, with these, uh, these regulatory rules uh, before Betty brought them up. I just saw that some of these rules were coming down the pipeline and I didn't know how or through what or what process. So that's a, I'm glad that we're starting to have a conversation. All right, so I'm gonna, oops, not stop sharing my screen, share my screen, but go to Google Docs and I'm gonna try to share. Is everyone okay if I share this document with everyone in the chat? Um, I think I might be able to, Lucian, I think I have. Send me the link and then I'll, I'll turn it around everywhere. You know, I think I have, I think I might be able to do it myself. Oops, nope, that's not the right one. That's Rules of New York. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing for a sec so I don't reveal anyone's emails and I'll be right back. <laughs> With the link to the Google Doc. Share. Just for the record, I'm, I'm not a plant, but boy, am I excited about this. Everybody <laughs> with me. <laughs> All right. So this is the document. I just put it in the chat that I'm going to be sharing on my screen. Um, I know it's it's a uh, it's tough for those of you who are on a phone or over the um, or on a smartphone or over the phone. But uh, if you can follow along, that's great. We'll always give people a chance to look at this after the meeting as well. And let me share my screen again. All right. So first, actually, I'm going to click on. There's a link in here to the document that we've been working on for the past, I think, three months. Uh, so we started off with a storm um, and we kind of ended up with a few different uh, values and problems for our district. Uh, some of the key values that we came out of, that came out of those conversations were, um, you know, advocating for comprehensive street safety in CD1, uh, making sure that pedestrians are safe in CD1, um, uh, making sure we're a sustainable district and then our, our kind of catch-all category, maximizing public benefit. Um, so I've gone through that at length with many of you, so I won't bore you guys again, but feel free to take a look through this anytime. Um, there were a few that ended up as problems that we are gonna address in future committee meetings. Um, so we're gonna focus on these values. So when Betty and I were reviewing these values over the past um, few weeks, what we thought would be helpful is to create some sort of document that helps us stay true or incorporate these values into the different conversations that we have whenever an agency, usually DOT, but sometimes others, um, come to us with some sort of project. Um, we thought it might be helpful to, similar to the way other committees, I think a lot of licensing and licensing, when an applicant comes before us, we have like a checklist because there's actual forms that we need to fill out. Um, and what that helps is that at the end of a conversation, we're looking through that form and we're like, oh, shoot, no one asked, you know, what are your operating hours or what, when are you getting deliveries? Um, so those checklists are really helpful in making sure that we're getting to all the points we need to in our committee discussions. We thought it might be helpful to do the same 
with the values we have and turn them into some sort of um, turn them into a checklist. Uh, and this would just be for committee members for us to use, um, you know, to take a look at. Uh, so I'm going to review this and I think the three things that I want to get from everyone in the committee is a um, do we think this is a good idea? Do you think it's helpful to have a checklist that we um, can reference uh, in our discussions? Um, B, like, do you think uh, there's, what do you think of the, the questions or the, the, the sections that we have currently? Um, and see if uh, you have any suggestions. Um, we'd love this for it to be a, like a group effort. So please volunteer any ideas, thoughts, things that are covered, aren't covered. Um, and again, we can carry this over into um, future committee meetings or because uh, I know it's, it's tough to, to be thinking about this all in the moment. Um, so with that, I'm going to do a quick summary of what we've got here, and then I'll open, up, open it up to a, a group discussion. Um, so one of the values that we talked about was comprehensive street safety. I actually should change it so it's consistent. Um, so one thing that we thought would be helpful to ask is, you know, uh, any project that comes before us really should be addressing street safety. It's not, and the city of New York should be doing that as part of their Vision Zero program. So just a yes or no, hey, is this going to help us reduce the number of crashes, injuries, and fatalities in CD1? Um, does the project include any of a number of street safe safety improvements? Um, and these are a bunch of safety improvements that the DOT actually has an internal checklist for, for any major transportation projects. They don't necessarily do this for smaller uh, transportation projects, but major transportation projects that I think are like four blocks or more and have a few different criteria, they actually do put out a checklist as to whether or not it includes any of these items. So they include ADA accessibility, bus bulbs, which I think we see like with our um, select bus service uh, or where the, the, um, the bus can pull in. Uh, bus lanes and daylighting, which I didn't know. Uh, I had to Google it. Daylighting is when uh, they make it such that there's no blockage in the intersection for like, I think, five to 10 feet in either way. So oftentimes, you know, and especially down here when we're crossing the street, uh, there will be a truck parked, you know, or some car parked or something parked that doesn't, that restricts your visibility as a pedestrian and seeing whether or not it's safe to cross the street. So daylighting is something that the DOT has been doing in their recent projects. And you can see it, I think, on Broadway, they've tried to do it the way that they uh, set up the parking. Um, dedicated vehicle loading and unloading, narrow vehicle lanes, uh, pedestrian safety islands, protected bike lanes, signal protected pedestrian crossings, signal retiming, which is when they change. So the, the signals, the, the red lights and the green lights and the pedestrian signals, are all timed differently depending on what intersection you're at. Uh, you'll know if you're ever walking across Water Street because it always takes longer than any of the other streets. Um, so and it can it can range between I think uh, gosh I can't remember it's like 45 to 150 seconds, but there's a range of different timings. And oftentimes when they're doing a project, they'll take a look and see if the the timing needs to be changed um, and wider sidewalks. Um, another question we thought that might be helpful to ask is you know what's the speed limit? Are there any speed cameras in the area? Um, will this impact a truck route? Uh, will it impact a bus route? Like, is, is this project going to get in the way of a bus route? Is it going to have any, are there going to be any consequences to that, et cetera? So that's the sort of discussion that sort of question can prompt. Another is, is there any conflict between different modes of transportation? Um, so, for example, uh, is there, is this like a mixing zone where, you know, cyclists are always running into pedestrians or where we're having issues with trucks parked here or there, but are different modes of transportation um, intersecting at this point? Um, another one is, are there un any unknown, any known unsafe or deferred maintenance in the project vicinity? So that's kind of a, a big bucket, but is there anything that's, that's kind of fallen apart in this area? Are there broken pavers in Tribeca? Is the cobblestone streets in good shape? Um, is there poor lighting already here? Um, have there been any problems? So we added this one based on the snowfall we had this, uh, this winter, but is this an area where frequently or in the past we've seen that there's been problems with snow clearance because perhaps maybe the, the plows can't get there or, or whatnot, but it just prompts that sort of discussion that, you know, if we're addressing this, maybe we can address this at the same time. Um, the next section is uh, about pedestrian safety, which does overlap with comprehensive street safety, but we're keeping them in separate buckets for now. 
Um, does pedestrian space and priority need to be improved? Uh, space or safety? Uh, those might be able to be, I guess we take a look at them. Um, does this project in, introduce any impediments? Like if it's a construction project, are we gonna be reducing the, the uh, sidewalk room for pedestrians? Uh, do we need some additional traffic calming? Is this like a West Street situation where whenever we, we talk to DOT and they're doing work on that stretch, we, we always talk about you know, traffic calming and how to make, improve things there. Um, accessible pedestrian signals. Um, so I believe, Betty, these are, this is when um, um, uh, the, it's the sounds, right? Uh, it's it sounds for low vision and blind. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, are pedestrian ramps present, adequate, and in good repair? Uh, do we need to add a crosswalk? We had this discussion in our last committee meeting. Um, do we need to do that, some that's an issue. So that's yeah. an issue right now that's been brought up on Battery Place by Second Place by mm -hmm. the school where there isn't one and, and someone complained they were almost hit with their child. Yikes. Yeah. Um, I just talked about signal retiming, but have we gotten a bunch of complaints? Do we need to relook at the signal retiming in the area? Um, will any of the work improve bus, bus boarding or speed? Um, the other section we had was about sustainability. And we had talked about a few metrics in our discussion, um, but if anyone has questions about these metrics, let me know. Um, one of them was VMT. Will this project help reduce vehicle miles traveled? Um, that's an important metric as we're looking at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, will this increase the options or access to safe, affordable, low or zero carbon transportation? Um, how would this improve sustainable public transportation? If a traffic signal is present, planned or requested, um, check out groups that would get a priority. And that's uh, because there's like a, uh, a new initiative is, is kind of giving transit or priority to different groups. They're trying to uh, implement a bunch of um, bus uh, priority at different intersections so that buses don't need to stop to stop at uh, at red lights. If they see a bus coming, um, then they'll, it'll go, the light will turn green so the bus can keep on going. Um, and in general, will it help reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in, in our district? Um, another section. I've only got one for maximizing public benefit. This was tough to quantify. So if anyone has any thoughts here, I'd, I'd welcome them. Uh, but this is just checking all the intended users of a project. You know, who do we expect? Who is this really targeting this project? Are we talking about residents, really workers, everybody, visitors or tourists? Um, is it a specific building or business or an individual? Because um, I know one of the things that we started talking about was we wanted to we wanted to think about how many how many users of these projects, like how many people are going to use this. I know we're talking about that with like city bike and parking spaces, but how many how many people benefit in our district from these different implementations on our streetscape? Because we know it's there's a limited amount of space and uh, a lot of um, competing interests. Well, um, mind, it also includes things that people come forward and ask us for, such as putting a sign up so that there's free you can, they can access to their buildings for people who ask to have a stop sign put up because there are a lot of children going on their way to school. This mm -hmm. is, so this is requests as well as projects being proposed. Great, great clarifying point. Can I ask you a question about something you just said, Michael, that I'm a little confused about? Uh, yeah, sure, what's up? Okay, <laughs> the thing, uh, I did hear something about, you said like the bus with, with where they might wanna like, if a bus is coming and it's a red light, then the light will kind of like be made to go green so the bus could continue. Mm -hmm. uh, can you like, like, is, is it basically just what I said that that's what they would do or is it a little more because just the, what I'm saying, if that's how it is, uh, at the risk of hurting the, uh, the, the, the green gas emissions, I could see that as an incredible recipe for disaster for pedestrians, for bicyclists. For other people, where the, the, the you know sometimes you do things as you're expecting it, like the light is is, is green, you you figure that it's going to be green, or the light's red when you're crossing the opposite way, and you figure there's a certain amount of time going as you're approaching it or as you're going into it, and I was just wondering, like exactly like what they mean by that, because it sounds good on paper, but I'm seeing like a disaster in practice in certain situations. Sure, sure. I'm not specifically, I'm not super familiar with how it's actually implemented. Um, but my my understanding is that 
on certain buses, there's some sort of, you know, radio signal or GPS, so they know when a bus is, is approaching an intersection. And I don't, be, I don't believe it would be like, a, you know, all of a sudden, uh, I'm in the middle of the crosswalk and it, then the light turns green. Uh, I think they do it, I think they time it in such a way that, uh, that pedestrians would still be able to cross. That just, um, just means, if, you know, if you're going five or 10 miles on a bicycle, sure. you know, the opposite, you know, like, like, like uh, uh, the opposite way, you know, you're, you're doing things according to, you know, your life experience and your, your expectations and, you know, and uh, I don't know, like, maybe I'm just, you know, like thinking like 50 years ago, but uh, some things seem good on paper, but sure. I know, this, it seems a little scary, like, like, at least from, from, you know, anyway, I was just curious. Well, can I, it's a good point, can and I... that's actually why we have this as a question, right? So that if a project's coming and they're going to do some sort of transit priority, or some sort of priority signaling, we can we can make sure to ask that, and then whoever's coming before us can tell us, you know, what the situation is going to be. But I can Michael, you Betty. Michael, can I ask Jennifer to clarify that sure. I think, like on the 14th Street busway, what it is is that the bus lane green light slightly ahead of the cars, so the cars can't all scoot in front of the bus. The bus okay. can get moving before the cars are then triggered to move forward. Okay, well that 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 I could I could see that uh, is just the way that it it was kind of worded before. Like it seemed a little, you know, a little a little more you know uh, dangerous. Thank you, and Betty. The other the other version of it is what um, for a lot of the other SBS routes is that it'll hold the green just for a couple seconds longer, just to allow it to move through the intersection. Okay, that's Thank the you. other that's the other flavor. <laughs> Great. I, I guess I'll carry on. If, did we want to see if Jennifer wanted to weigh in? But thank you for jumping in, guys, because I, yeah, I'm not, I'm no expert on all these. And again, this isn't, so we're not advocating for any of these in here. This is just us wanting to make sure that we're collecting this sort of information whenever a project or a request comes our way. I have um, my hand up. Oh, do I have a hand? Um, yeah, I can't see the hands, but go right ahead. It's Pat. Can you hear me? I'll pull it up. Yeah, I can hear you, Pat. How's it going? So I don't know where this has been, but should we discuss ambulances and EMT and fire trucks and whether projects impact them and how to get them get clear of the road so they can get through faster? I don't know how this fits into this conversation. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a great idea because we have uh we have like a few that's like, okay, is this on a bus lane? Is this in a bus route? Is this on a truck route? Um, I, I feel like it, it probably is relevant for us. And I, I wonder if Betty has any thoughts about where this might fit. Even just asking, hey, is this, in the, is this on a route to a hospital? Um, is this on a route to a fire department? Because that comes up um, frequently, I feel like, when we have project or request discussions. What do you think, Betty? Well, first, if Jennifer has anything to say, because usually they just move through traffic where there's space. Sometimes they can't move. Sometimes they're there on their. Yeah, no, that that is a problem when traffic just won't give way, and there are people who just plain follow them, which is a legal issue. And now you're back to enforcement, and that's rare that a policeman is going to do anything, or second, they happen to be there at the same time. I just wish there was a way of getting people on the line. And, you know, if they can't, if the, if the emergency responders cannot move through the traffic, is there some way we could help to speed that up? Uh, why don't we put that down on a list of things to look into? Because I don't know if they have a way of triggering the lights to turn green as they move forward yeah. or any, I, I, I don't, don't think know. They do now, but if they can for the buses, they might be able to do it for us. The yeah. yeah, no, that's a great thought. Thanks for writing that down, Betty. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll try to go through, there's only a few more on here. So we had one, so this was a new section that got added or talking about equity. We didn't, I guess, we did, I guess, address this a little bit in our discussions. We want to make sure we kind of think about this when we're having discussions with any project, you know, how does this factor into equity? Does it deal with equity? We know that there are underinvested uh, areas in any district, including ours, um, and making sure that that's at least part of the conversation, even if 
if, even if it wasn't part of you know the project or request, um, but something worth us just keeping top of mind. Um, and then the last section is there's like we had um, I think uh, was it the right of way request when we were dealing with Battery Park City um, Authority. Uh, just a section for are there any relevant documents or forms that the applicant or the agency has filled out for this project and have we received it? Um, so yes, that's, and that's actually revocable consent. Ah, I that's worded revocable. it incorrectly. Gotcha. I can change that. Great. So, so that's what we've got here. So again, I would love, I know Mitch and, and Pat had some great thoughts. Does anyone else have any thoughts about this? I'd love to hear again, A, if you think this is a good idea, and B, if there was any edits, changes that you'd like um, to, to consider or have us all consider. Um, again, this should be, anything that we do in this committee should be kind of as, as much of a group effort as we can make it. I see no hands. Which then I would ask, because I think it's very helpful to us as leadership in organizing things and keeping track of projects. Is there any objection to us starting to try piloting it to see what works, what doesn't work, what's missing? What's... It's quiet. I said, do you want to try piloting it? For a set period of time and yeah i mean if there are no objections I, I think like betty's saying this this can be a sort of living document as we uh continue using it perhaps we decide that certain questions aren't relevant certain things are not being used maybe some things that are frequently coming up in our discussions need to be added um, but it would be something that we could all just reference um just for a, a bit of um a, a larger context um this this kind of standard standardization of how uh, a committee comes in and, at, and analyzes something i think is a very effective approach that's um, best known um, with the licensing committee who has you know a, a questionnaire and it tries to create an apples to apples uh, comparison to what they like and what they don't like and it helps them kind of establish you know, uh, uh, more objective standards on how to how to view an application. I think it's it's well done, and I think that it's uh, it's great to see something similar being extended to other committees. And I think this is a great a great direction. Michael, can I just ask you? You have this one. Are there any speed cameras in the vicinity? Yes, yeah. a great question. It would be impossible for just a lay person to answer that. Is that something that you would have through the through? I mean, through uh, Lucian or somebody have access to that information, or because we wouldn't I, we wouldn't normally be able to answer it unless somebody you know <laughs> it's really blatantly obvious. Yeah, no, that's a great question because, like you say, there's some of these that we can actually answer ourselves before we have any discussion, but there's yeah. some that we might need information from the DOT. I think right. Lucian, do you know is speed camera data? We have the locations for that somewhere, right? Is that or they is that... move them around right now? I think I think they move the cameras uh, okay. because they only have a, a fixed number of them. Though that has been that has been expanded um, by the state, and I think the city has has made some noises about saying you know they want them. I know that they want them on all the time, but um, I don't I don't know if they've legislatively expanded it to whether yeah. by all schools. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe Jennifer will know more about that than me. Got it. So yeah, I think ultimately, yeah, that's a question that we'll ask any applicant that comes our way because it's something we may or may not know. Well, we may Anyone have to ask a third oh, party. Right. Yep. I think speed cameras, I think there are 750 right now, and they're on 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday. And, um, and, and there has been discussion to increase those hours or increase the number. Right. Yeah, thanks, Ada. There's no other thoughts, and maybe I'll turn it back to Betty. 
fine. You can stop sharing and yeah. just go to the next slide. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for everyone's time again. Uh, and please uh, take a look at this. Um, again, we can we can talk about it and edit it as we as we can. Well, as we can why don't we start trying to pilot it and give it you know three to six months? Sure. But people can comment during that period. Yeah. Yeah. We'll collect comments. Yeah. And we can. Yeah. We can have. We'll have a discussion okay. later. Yeah. They'll see it used and they can comment as it's being used. Yeah. That's great. Awesome. So I will go back and share my screen. Oops. So we were on street use, now we're on congestion pricing. Yes, and this is really more an open discussion because we want to I want to know how to move forward for a resolution. If you go to the next one, you'll see the questions that I want people here to address. Oops. Sorry, I wanted to review for people past precedent. I doubt you all happen to have these old resolutions at your fingertips. So I'll remind you what the community board has said in the past. Uh, in January of 2008, it was an alternative congestion pricing plan. What they said was multiple requests to change the legislation, but that legislation ultimately failed anyway. So it never was activated. The goals of that program were fairly similar. They were to reduce traffic congestion, improve air quality and public health, help pay for transit repairs, encourage alternative modes of transportation, and to keep the city's economy strong. Sound familiar? Now, here we are, 12 years, well, 19 years later. Anyway, CB1 did support it in general. They had concerns about it. It didn't pass. In 2018, there was another resolution. You're probably more likely to remember. This was about the current program. So again, it wasn't passed yet. They were speculating. They did not take a general position on the current congestion pricing program. So there is no precedent there. Uh, they called for open and transparent dialogue. They asked that all revenue go to the New York City Transit, which we know by law is going 20, 20, 80. 20% to the Long Island Railroad, 20% to the Northern up to Westchester, and 80% to New York City. Uh, they called for a stakeholder engagement and that it must address excessive burden on residents and small businesses in the congestion zone. 2019, as but this was prior to passage, but it was immediately before passage, uh, they stated that they believe New York City should have greater control over the program, but that's now been mandated by law. Uh, and they demanded congestion pricing not be passed without further review. But as we know, it's been passed. So we're not too bound here by precedence, but I wanted you to know what was out there and has been said in the past. Go to the next one. You'll see the questions I'd like for discussion. If possible, let's do them one at a time so we can, I can get a feel for what you think about each of these issues so I can plan better for future meetings. So let's start with, do you agree with the goals of the program? The goals are to improve mass transit, to reduce congestion, and to improve air quality. Any comments in any way about any of those? Hey, Jamie, Betty, do you think we do you think we can unpack some of them? Because I think that clumping them together is a little high, and you might get a better response if we separated. Because there could be a way to improve mass transit and improve air quality, but whether or not congestion currently specifically is an issue would be something that I don't know, you know, based on current conditions and the lack of return to work, the raise in remote, the closing of businesses, congestion at the moment is not really present in the city. You know, then so I, would, no, I, I know we're ask... forward thinking, looking, but, I think that I think that some of them having been so tightly bundled might you might want to say yes to one but not agree that 
there's another. So I don't know if you want to just a question on there. Yeah, no, these can all be handled completely separately. They can be handled with, I agree with it, but I don't think congestion pricing is the answer. I do think it's the answer. I mean, you can say whatever you want. I want to get feedback on to what people even think of these goals individually to collectively related to or unrelated to congestion pricing. You can deal with it any way you want. If all that everybody agrees there, the goals aren't worthy, then that's of its own import. Well, Betty, you just said something that I actually totally agree with. Uh, I mean, in, in one of your, your suppositions, uh, yes, I, so my answer to the first question, and I agree with what Tammy said, yes, I agree, uh, we need to improve mass transit, we need to reduce congestion, and we need to improve air quality, but congestion pricing is not the answer, in my opinion, especially in this, in this time that we're living in. So, uh, uh, I, I would take like that once that one possible one possible answer that you just said. That's what I, I of course nobody's against uh, improving air quality and, and improving mass transit, but for me the congestion pricing is is not the answer at this time and place. And uh, do you mean that is that timing your biggest issue, or do you mean really at any time? Well, I guess I believe that that's something that. Our regular taxes and what government is is it, just like the paving of the roads and our police and firemen and schools. Uh, you know, I, I I actually read a lot of the stuff that you sent, Betty, and I took some notes. I didn't want to like dominate all the things on the first one, so I'll, I'll just say one note that I took, and then I'll I'll chime in as we we move on. Hey. One of the big things in the study that you sent us, it said. The implementation in, in, implementation of transit improvement needs to be done prior to starting congestion pricing. There's we're not even close to that, so that's why I can't even I couldn't even consider that until the implementation of transit is like you know what came first the chicken or the egg. I take the trains all the time because I have to, and they're starting to get crowded, and it's not safe. I'm talking about, you know, with the pandemic and everything like that. And I don't have to usually take the trains in rush hour, but a few months ago, like, but right before the pandemics really hit, I had to take the trains in rush hour. Uh, and I had to wait. I, I was either the, the, the 34th street or the 14th street, like train station for three trains to pass while people were like in rows up to the edge of the platform, it was it was dangerous. I think maybe it was 14th Street where some of the, the areas like the four, five or six train and it curves around. And to you know you know to, to add even more people to the to the transit system before it's there's improvements in the service and the expansion of service, I think it's a dangerous thing. So uh I, I, I don't think that it's, it's I, I, the goals are, are definitely, I don't think anybody would be against improved mass transit, reduced congestion and improving air quality, but not congestion pricing uh, for a, about a thousand other reasons of economic and, 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 uh, and, and health and safety right now. It's, it's, I'm hearing two things from you. I just want to confirm that. One of I'm them sorry. is, and I just want to confirm two things that you said with you. So I'm doing it correctly. Okay. One is that you don't believe that congestion pricing is something that should be done. It should be a purview of the government doing it. And two, if they're going to do anything of that sort, improvement needs to come in capacity and all that before any move is made to encourage people to get on, more people to get on it. Right. Well, actually, you're right, but I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Yes, I, the, answer, yeah. the answer to your first uh, 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 question is yes. I believe just personally, as a, I guess, more of a, a liberal Democrat, that I feel that that's a responsibility of the government, and it shouldn't be what we have to go through for those of us that travel on airplanes, things that used to be taken for granted. Now the people with more money can pay to get the, 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 the just common decent perks that used to be uh, 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 comfortable for everybody, whether it's, you know, 
getting your, your bag on a plane or, 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 or decent service. Uh, so, so that's number one. Yes, the answer to your first thing is yes. And then the second thing is, I think, until the government does that and improves the mass transit, because right now services are being cut, and then to have more people go on, I think that's an unhealthy situation and something that I'm seeing all the time right now because I'm a, I'm a uh, uh, you know, somebody that doesn't drive a car 90% of the time. And I can't, I, I wish I could bike to things, places I have to go and carry, but I'm, I'm not able to, at least, you know, most of the time. So I'm on public That's transportation. Fine. So the answer is yes and yes. Great, then as long as I have you correctly, is there anyone else? One who has any comments to make about agreeing with the goals themselves or disagreeing with them and Michael. Yeah, I'll go if no one else is, because I, I know I've, I've already spoken on this meeting, um, but I guess I'll go for it. Uh, I, uh, I, yeah, I agree with the goals. Um, I, I think it's interesting because the, the first goal was, I think, the real instigator for congestion pricing. It was uh, the, gosh, it was that summer when the trains weren't running on time at all. Uh, and uh, so the, the main goal was to get more funding for mass transit. And, but I do agree with all three. I think the problem is, is that it's, I think this program's a little focused on goal number one um, instead of goals two and three. And I think you're seeing that like in the way that Mitch just said, if you're really like gonna invest in this program, I really would love to see um, investment in uh, like improving transportation alternatives before it's implemented. We're, and we're clearly not seeing that. And I think that's like a failing of, uh, of the city. That said, I would love it to be a prerequisite, but I also think pre making it a prerequisite is dangerous because I think there are benefits that you get from just implementing the program. But obviously, everyone would be much better off if we were seeing, you know, bike lanes and bus lanes and et cetera being added beforehand instead of we're going to be doing all this thinking um, after the fact. Thank you. You'll catch 22. Let's have mm -hmm. Mimi and then Talon. Hey, um, yeah, I agree with the goals. I feel that the the mass transit situation, if if we successfully reduce congestion, then how will we continue making money other than through the captive drivers, like people that can't stop driving? It's um, will be, you know left with the bill and also like how are we going to keep track of the um, you know, kpis as we like to call them in the business um like how do we these key performance indicators need to be i i think publicly um displayed and you know like do we have historical data saying that you know this is how it's been with air quality and um you know this is how congestion has historically been um documented like how do we keep track of all that like how do we know that this is actually working like other than you know i can cross the street without waiting for the the indicator to change more often you know what i mean like it will yes uh, i do it would be nice to know like how we're keeping track of these things and um the mta isn't really known for being well managed so if we're going to be giving them the money, it would be nice to keep track of how that is being used and if they're being managed better. Yeah, so demand MTA accountability. Yeah, and we should do that anyway, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's long been said, so yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. If someone's going to pay, even though supportive, they really don't want it wasted. So that will work. And as far as your first comment, I have to kind of chuck, I'm chuckling at that one. Uh, what happens when you're successful and more and more people stop driving uh, and or the uh, pollution goes down? And if you look at some of the countries, such as London, that's exactly what they're going through now. And they're looking to Stockholm to get more ideas because they're running out of the money they need to keep going 
and they're also having pollution problems that they weren't expecting to be as bad as they are. So, no, it is an ever evolving program. And I think everybody in the world has shown that. So, yeah, no, bringing that up and asking for metrics and that they be available is very valuable. So, thank you for that. Kaylin? Uh, yeah, I just want to say that I definitely agree with the goals. And I think the kind of whole idea or dynamic behind this program is to implement the charges. So, you know, to get drivers off the roads and onto public transportation. But, you know, at the same time, we have to consider, um, okay, we've gotten the people off the roads now and more people are using public transit now, but is the funding that we're getting from this and other funding that's coming in from, you know, the government and other organizations, is this enough to, um, you know, cope with the increased demand uh, if we're successful in getting people off the road. Uh, will these funds that we have and are getting, will this be enough to cope with the increased demand that we're going to have on public transportation, um, like trains? And as uh, Mitchell was saying, uh, the problems that already exist and will be further exacerbated um, if we, we, we were to be successful in this and have more people on public transit. Um, Yes, it might mean we're getting some more funding from the congestion pricing, uh, but we're also going to have more people. And so those problems are going to be even greater than they are now. And so will that funding be able to keep up with the rapid increase in demand and the problems that are going to be harder to fix and the expansion and infrastructure that's going to be needed, uh, you know, in order to accommodate this, these new amounts of people. Uh, so I think that's definitely something that could be considered as well. Do you think it should also be equitable? Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, what do you mean by equitable? I'm willing to take that from any direction somebody wants to volunteer. Uh, the question being, if we are very concerned about uh, congestion and we are concerned about air quality, what about those people who live in transit deserts? who really need a car more than anyone else does in the city to come into town, would it be agreeable to us as a community board if the money was disproportionately spent in parts of the city where people are coming to us but aren't residents? They may be workers. You mean like I mean, the tri-state area, Betty? I was gonna even stick with New York City. At this so point. you don't consider people from the Bronx, Brooklyn, Staten Island, and Queens all part of the same city? Yes, they are. Okay, so then I... Friborough, I meant I'm not going to worry about Connecticut and New Jersey right now. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's that's hard. Like, are we allocating it based on population density, amount of commuters? I mean... Oh. We, uh, no, no, no. We are commun Manhattan Community Board 1. Our perspective on what we talk about we advocate for the people who live and work and visit Manhattan Community Board 1. So you have to always keep this lens in where we're going on this because we're not advocating for, you know, for Jersey and Brooklyn and Queens. They have their advocates who are quite rightly putting their comments in. We need to really take a look at the effects of the people who live, work, and visit just in terms of where we are for CB1. Yeah, no, I'm talking about working too. I'm thinking of my doorman and other people who do not live in Manhattan. Right. I, I agree with that, Betty, what you just said. Tammy, but the thing is, yes, technically that's the function of, of this board, but there are certain things that come up that we we could like, like a pine on or vote on that sometimes do have a big effect on people outside of our community and sometimes you know selfishly something could really affect us benefit us but really be you humanly not right for our neighbors so that's where i think it's not just black and white even though in general i agree with you tammy but i don't think it should just be black and white like that it's not about black and white, it's about priority lenses, Mitch. We have True, to we have to we have to put C B one 
in this kind of a conversation, all the community boards and everyone is advocating for what they need for their communities. We need to try and, and, and start granular and then go big. Okay. You can, but what if people want to go visit their sons and daughters who happen to live in the Rockaways, but they live here? I mean, it, it's hard to cut everybody that, off from everyone that, that works is, for them or lives or is friends of theirs. That's, that's where the conversations had gone. Many people said about the penalties of living in the location, right? And, and taking a look at what others have done, which is why, for example, London did the residential exemptions, right? They did emergency vehicles, residents, you know, vehicles used for disabled people, alternate fueled vehicles are exempt. I mean, there are many different exemptions. Stockholm did it slightly differently. Um, well, although that's they why did include London's in... looking to Stockholm because London's having problems with theirs. And... But again, it's it's about trying to take a look at what others have done, what's worked, and what has happened. Um, am I the only one that thinks that this is something that, like infrastructure, whether it's like highways, interstate highways? Or it's it's the, the 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 infrastructure here for for improving mass transit is a function of government and just like 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 they don't ask us to chip in well you know like if if uh, for schools even though like there are some schools you know in rich districts where the PTA raises a lot of money and for extra that's great but am I the only one that think that this is something that uh, that's that's one of the things that government should be like. You know, uh, great on and 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 this one of the functions of government and where all our tax dollars are supposed to go or i mean of course these 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 three these these goals are fantastic reduce congestion air, pro air quality and mass transit but uh does anybody else feel that this should be a function of government and not like in the, you know like like just continuing to 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 make our the citizens pay but we sort of do the same thing with others. This wouldn't. There is precedent. I'm sorry, Betty. I can. There is precedent for user taxes, such as cigarette taxes, when there is increased health risk. <laughs> that, that, uh, the yes, fact that people using taxis are analogy. paying congestion. Right. That's a false analogy. With all due respect, uh, I mean, uh, 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 a drug that can kill people. Can, you know, it's when 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 some people have no choice. And like I anyway, I'm. I don't want to. I was just curious if anybody else thinks that this is a function of government, where government should be stepping in uh, now that you know, uh, or normal government should be stepping in as opposed to. Uh, well, let me see if Mimi has her hand up for that reason, for the response. I had just left my hand up. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. Well, do you have a comment to make? I. I... I just, no, I don't, nothing okay. useful. That's fine. Then I guess there's no real answer for you for the, on that one, Mitch. Uh, I'm glad to hear. Is there anyone that disagrees with the goals and fundamentally has problems with it? Or can I assume that we can move on from that? People somewhat agree with the goals. So we can move on with the concerns about the program, which Mitch has already started with. Um, and do you have a suggestion for addressing the concerns, the concerns, which he has also said he thinks tax money should do it uh, instead. Timing is especially bad. And I will let uh, Mimi, I will let you speak and then Taylor. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I feel like, you know, I guess maybe I'm not aware of other programs that are supposed to help the MTA, but I, I am afraid that this could be a silver bullet kind of thing where, um, you know, and, and that doesn't seem quite like, I feel like we should spread a wider net if we want to like, quote, save the MTA. Um, and yeah, it just kind of seems like there's a bit of risk in that. What would you suggest? I want to make sure I understand. Uh, I think that tax money would be good, like what Mitch is saying, um, mm -hmm. like a different way of taxing. Like, you know, if we legalize marijuana, it would be really cool if some of that money went to taxes, like to tax uh, the tax money from that would go to the MTA. Um, I just realized I don't have my video on. 
Okay, so another source of funding from the government. Yeah, yeah, somehow like a a different you know source of funding, something that might be more sustainable. Because if if this is successful, then a small amount of people that don't use the MTA will be paying for it, right? Um, and and we have yet to understand what that group of people will be, who those drivers are. Yeah, there's a lot we don't know. Uh, Talon and then Tammy and Michael. Yeah, and I wanted to definitely agree that this is more of, you know, that I think is something that's more of a short term thing. And I think this is just a, you know, a push to get people to, you know, make the switch over and to bring people and money from one place to another. Uh, in this case, it's, you know, from congestion and the use of vehicles and stuff to the goals that are outlined here. Um, and I definitely agree with Mitch in that, yeah, um, definitely for the long run, you know, the government should have well, a, bi a, a bigger role in, you know, providing the funding and the resources to accommodate for the expansion that's going to continue as that's going to be needed probably as a result of, you know, this program. Um, and so definitely, yeah, um, I would agree that that's the case that they should have a bigger role in the funding. Uh, and this is sort of just a supplement to kind of move things from one place to another and to make that push. And then, you know, once that is set up to have a strong foundation uh, with the government um, and with the taxes uh, in play with that, just to help continue and expand once, you know, um, things start to shift over a little bit if this program is successful. Okay, so you're not talking about getting rid of congestion pricing i.e. temporary, you're talking more that keep it where it is and plan for the government to take a bigger role? Yeah, use it as a way, kind of as a stepping stone uh, for them to have an increased presence and allocate more resources into, you know, um, accommodating for the growth and expansion that's going to be needed with, you know, the infrastructure and everything. Uh, yeah, cause there, there are a lot of projections out there. Tammy. Thanks so much, and I apologize I didn't have my video on before, and I'm the one asking everybody to put videos on all the time. Uh, I'll just say dinner hour, inmates taking over the asylum in my house. Um, I put it in the chat, one of the comments that I realized afterwards. Sydney had an interesting example because when they looked at congestion pricing, they had a lot of kickbacks for different reasons. Um, some of them included in some of the, the reasons that surround here. But they went very drastic and they started charging an annual fee for, you know, parking spots in the dense neighborhoods, i.e., you know, FIDI, um, people who had exemptions were people with mobility permits, you know, religious establishments um, and people who owned property. So if you, you know, owned a townhouse, you got the spot outside. Um, and they raise approximately 72 million a year, again, from a very small city comparative to New York, but it yeah. did address some of the arguments about congestion pricing, because one of the things that um, people do talk about, and I don't disagree with, is the privacy concerns on the camera infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? Um, privacy concerns are big, and in the US, in Lately, with the ability to, you know, track your phone, track your car, track you everywhere, there is some of those conversations that come up as a concern against it. And we've talked long and hard on this board. Of, you know, if I had my wickedest dream, I would get rid of every possible city parking agency spot because I have, I have witnessed people driving in with their placard putting it on their private car, walking three spots and getting into a city vehicle. I mean, it's just so unfair. It's so wrong. It adds to the congestion, the double car thing, which is all over our district. So, I, you know, I'm a, I'd I'm love to see if a, I can find Jennifer. I just sent an email to Lucian and I will make sure you were on it. One of the things DOT is looking to get rid of in the CAPA is to eliminate the rule about reducing employees driving into the city. 
So I thought it might be why it would catch your attention when they rewrite that rule. I, uh, you know, I, I found it really interesting that they needed to assign a thousand more people to a thousand more policemen transit to ride the subways. Well, if you had a thousand of them that rode the subways home and to work, That's then we Chicago wouldn't need does. to be paying overtime for people to ride the transit system. That's so it Chicago just seems does. really exactly yeah. so. I think those are the kinds of things that we should be pushing for already, because if you can get that, we can lower congestion. If the goal is always to lower congestion, then we need to take a look. It's not, sadly, I don't think it's the people who live here or the people who are the small business operators who cause the most amount of trouble. I don't even think it's the tourists, although you know how much I love the tourist buses. <laughs> um, I really think it's, it's this double-decker car thing that we've got going and the ostensible right. I mean, we're, we're, we have the opportunity now more than ever to start making some business calls and saying, if we are the central business district in lower Manhattan, then you take mass transit to get here. If you have a work car, then you must take, you know, you, you can't park two cars on the street. It's just not, just not good. No, I agree. That is that is a big concern. The, it it's it needs to deal with the lack of commuting by mass transit from city workers. For like I said, I'll make sure that you get a copy of that email because it's one of the rules that concerns me. That they're dropping the rule that the DOT has about commuting vehicles. And trying to reduce yeah. the number of city employees that commute. It's like, don't take the cap off. I mean, I think if you really want to talk about congestion pricing, then then you need to scrap all of it to start with. You have to scrap every placard, every permit, every parking spot, and then really see what lower Manhattan looks like. Oh, and that would That's go for what Chicago officials. Did. And that would go for elected officials and all their staff. No offense intended to them, but yeah. Uh, that's happened because I, yeah, I know a lot of them are known for parking on the sidewalks and in the parks. So, I mean, that's, I guess the question, Betty, is does Chicago have congestion pricing? How does it work? No, they have no free parking on the street. They have at one inch of snow, you, no parking is allowed on the major streets. Uh, so there's lots of times when no parking is allowed. It's greatly restricted. And even in London, the free parking is for an hour. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, there, there are things that we should take a look at. Uh, I don't mind being bold, making unhappy recommendations towards the government agencies that inhabit our space. Yes, I know. We'll take a look at that rule. That's another thing to dig into is why are they getting rid of that and have they replaced it? Because city parking is, is an issue. Well, we'll find out. If you can't park on the street, where do people park? In, in where? In Chicago. Um, oh, in Chicago. Uh, a lot of people, they have to find a place off the street. I mean, it's when there's but snow, mean? it means you garage? get yourself a parking space. You can't count on the street. But they've got me the They're garage. very different than we are, though. Like, they have a lot of. Like, so is it an affordable garage? We don't have affordable garages. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people don't own cars or they, they move out away from. <laughs> Believe me, I've I've lived there for decades and it's doable. But there is no free parking in the areas like Manhattan. There's nothing. You know, if 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 the mass transit was made so it's it's such a pleasant experience, <laughs> people would like people. Nobody just wants to drive downtown, you know, from like like because it's just a hassle. With all the things that we're, we're talking about, I, I, this is like the chicken and the egg. If 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 the government would improve mass transit, clean, safe, comfortable, 
you wouldn't, the, the congestion would go down because more people would want to take it. It's the fastest way of travel in most, most cases. And, and uh, I think that that should be, you know, the infrastructure of the mass transit, the government, the, 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 the better they get the mass transit, the more people will use it. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just like anything with, with, with uh, economics 101 or, or business 101. Give them a good product and they'll, they'll, they'll use it. Well, what do you think of the English plan? I know in Cambridge and London and those, they have parking and it's called park and ride. They have various lots outside the congestion or busy well, zone. They have that, like I said, I, I don't live there, but they, I mean, like, like obviously along stops of the Long Island Railroad and yes. in, in Jersey with, with the New Jersey Transit, they have those things. Uh, unfortunately, there's so many people that live in or their schedules or their jobs, you know, like, like don't always jive with all those things. Like what Tammy was saying, it would be wonderful if all the policemen could take the trains to work and then take the trains back home. But everybody doesn't live like, like in one of the five borough neighborhoods, you know? Uh, like, I don't know, I just, you know, make the, 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 the man, yeah, it would be great if if you had like uh, if you can drive to the uh, I don't know to, to 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 Bensonhurst or to Riverdale or if you live in those areas and and drop your car off because you know or, or, or the Rockaways or Howard Beach and drop your car off and then have a really great ride in at all hours of the day or night safely, cleanly, and comfortably, most people would do that. Well, that's why EDC is trying to expand some of the ferry service and some of those. Yeah, They've gone those, into the rockaways. All those things are great. I just feel that's the government's responsibility with everything else that we have to pay for taxes and everything like that. Uh, but, you know, so. Uh, well, and this committee too. So we will move towards some of those things we would like moved or more available to us because I think those things are going to change too. Yeah. Some of the hospital services, some of the uh, ways to get to different locations that are difficult to get to from here. We will get there. I just, I just want to interject, but just remember that the parking for like the police and the firemen, that's all part of their union contract. And this has been something I've argued about for years. I don't see, and my dad was a cop, but I don't see why it's fair that people who have remained in the city, live in the city, the taxes in the city, can't park, but people who are driving in who chose to move to the outer, either the outer boroughs or beyond, have parking, free parking. And I'll shut up. You know, they're not guaranteed. They're not. All they're, it's, Betty and I, I think uh, two years ago, maybe. Yeah, Betty Tammy and I were got tracked, it. Yeah, I got a copy of the union contract. Um, <laughs> they're not guaranteed parking. They're just guaranteed parking that the city doesn't pay for. What it says that, is that the that DOT will allocate, will let them know spaces they can use. Exactly. And if you look at every firehouse, around every firehouse, around every police station, they have allocated parking on the street. The DOT hasn't, the police have, and the mayor allows it. Exactly. So. Yeah, because, because you, we, we, we tried to get that changed in how things work in Battery Park City. And DOT, basically, there weren't enough spaces to offer them. And so they just took it on their own. And that's how that works around every firehouse, every police station. I mean, you can take a look at where the, um, not the 10 house, the house, the Dwayne Street house, uh, you know, firehouse. They have, they have assigned parking and then they double park in around their assigned parking. Or when they, they take it. Well, oh, when they put the right, because when they put the Eric the Erickson Street put all those barricades up, the DOT didn't know or approve the barricades, but no one can fight with the police, and the mayor won't. Or the fire department. Exactly. Well, exactly. Yes. So yeah, no, I agree. That's okay. So there are a number of concerns. The privacy camera one has come up in the past, so there's even a precedent for that one. Uh, but yes, going up to city workers and the commuting, that's also there's a precedent for uh, looking at parking, looking at various options that there are for transit, you know, park and rides and other things to make it easier for people to use mass transit. 
improving mass transit, anything else? And then I'll move on to questions. And there are a number of hands. So Michael, Tammy, Detta. Sure, I'll try to be quick. Uh, but I do want to say I'm 100% there for Tammy's suggestion about starting from scratch, no placards, no, uh, no assigned municipal things. And partly because I am concerned that um, those with placards are going to try to um, skirt the congestion pricing. Like, I'm concerned that I, I think we should be very strong uh, in saying that, you know, placards doesn't mean you don't get to pay because, um, uh, yeah, that's problematic. Um, then second, I do want to second uh, what Mimi was saying about, uh, you know, what happens if if the program's too successful um, because, you know, one of the issues is, is the MTA is bonding out the, the revenues, the expected revenues from congestion pricing. So um, you're a bit tied to how much you're promising uh, the banks, what the return is going to be. Uh, and so that does in the back end, if, if the program, you know, there are a lot of ifs, but like if the program is extremely successful, it does provide a little inflexibility uh, at the end because uh, we are kind of tied to these revenue targets. Um, to that end, I think it would be important to, um, I, I like in the, the RPA document you sent us, they had one of the suggestions, which was like a higher um, uh, surcharge during peak hours, which would result in a much lower uh, charge during off peak. Uh, because I think it's important to, I mean, if, I guess it could help solve that problem such that people, the, the people that really are forced to, to drive in could choose to do it in the off hours and, and not have to have, um, take that huge uh, financial hit. So that's something I think, or just the, the way we price the peak and off peak is worth uh, looking into. Do you want information about it, which is more like uh, number three, or do you want just discussion on that? Oh, variable sorry. What pricing, was that? On variable pricing, are you recommending a discussion on it, or like number three, you want to have speakers come in and talk more about variable pricing? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think I'd be okay with just a discussion on it. Like even just discussing, mm -hmm. I think I think RPA had like three or four different options that I thought were correct. Um, I think even just looking at having the committee look at those and see which ones we prefer. Great. And in fact, most everywhere in the world has that or is moving to it. So it seems to be successful for others. Uh, Detta, Rosa, and then we'll go to there's. I'm going to pronounce this miserably, but there is someone in the attendees that, yes, you will go next after Rosa. Zeta, you yeah. muted. Um, as long as government workers and municipal workers do not have a carve out, then they would be paying the congestion fee if they choose to drive in. So. Um, that might be a way to help reduce the number of city employees who choose to drive in. If there are people who have the option of Western North or Long Island Railroad or a subway ride, then they weigh that option against their their choice of driving in. So if driving becomes, you know, comparatively slightly more expensive um, for some people who have an option, then they'll, they'll make a different choice of how to come in, and that might help reduce the number of government workers who choose to come in and then that would reduce the number who are then parking on the street. As long as there's no carve out. But that's all I want to say. Okay, that's usually pretty consistent theme. Which is Rosa. Hi, thank you. Hi. Um, so I agree 100% with the goals of the program, but I also feel like I need to learn more. So as relates to number three, I think it would be helpful um, to have somebody come in and speak more fully on the specifics of what congestion pricing involves. Um, I also agree, um, no carve outs. I think um, placard parking is, horrendous in our district agree with Tammy 100% and it absolutely needs to be dealt with in some way or form. Um, 
And then sort of maybe tangentially, but maybe also part of this conversation is, I don't know if you guys have read about the transportation alternatives proposal to take back 25% of the street to utilize for, to convert into like bike lanes, um, expanded and, and safe sidewalk space. I mean, one of the first main frustrations I've had with the coronavirus phase where you're theoretically supposed to stay six feet away from someone is that it's actually physically impossible, at least in FIDI where I live, it is literally physically impossible to stay six feet away from another pedestrian unless you are walking in the street. So, um, and then between, you know, all the different obstacles, anyways, I could go on forever on that one, but, you know, part of the whole sort of taking back 25% of the street proposal is that then there would also be a way to locate some sort of sane publicly, you know, and easily accessible like garbage collection areas, which you know, I know garbage isn't a particularly exciting subject, but we all have it everywhere and literally mountains of it. Um, and it would be interesting to have a sort of a holistic urban planning streetscape review to think about how we can tackle these issues if we get rid of or convert um, the space that we have currently given over to free parking spaces or an extra lane or whatever um, into by safe bicycling lanes and safe sidewalks that could also address our garbage issues. So. I mean, I highly recommend that everybody look into the whole transportation alternative thing. I know that um, a lot of the mayoral candidates have already gotten behind it. And um, I think that that would be something that would be really good for this committee to address at some point, if you haven't already. That's it for me. Thank you. And thank you very much for this whole conversation. I think it's incredibly useful. And, and another thing you might find interesting since you like the trans alt plan, because uh, it's what city of London, city of London is only one square mile. It is not the whole, what we think of as the city of London. City of London is the historic London. They have their own mayor. They have their own rules from greater London. They're different. Anyway, city of London, if you Google it online, you can see, they have a traffic plan and they are doing to supplement the congestion pricing, which is what started with them. And it is a big business district. They are making all kinds of street changes and have decided one thing they need to do is make it difficult to drive and difficult to drive quickly. So they're making these in conjunction with congestion pricing to dealing with the congestion and safety issues. I used to live in London and I, I personally think that's amazing because the traffic there was absolutely horrendous and the pollution was even worse. And actually, I so I also used to live in Rome and I remember that what they had these, um, they instituted something with uh, license plates where you had, because they had so much pollution in the city, the acid and the pollution was literally eating away at all the historical <laughs> monuments that they had there in the ruins, right? The ruins were basically being acidified into to nothing. And so they had this plan where they, each, each car resident, whatever, uh, got a license plate and let's say it was A or B and you know, you had designated days when your license plate was able to drive into the city. And if it wasn't your day, then you had to figure something else out. And I mean, I think every major city has to deal with this because it's such a huge problem. I mean, I think that the more space that vehicles are given, the more they will need. It's just, it immediately fills up. And so I think we just need a, a, a like an overhead holistic view of what do we actually want our city to be? What do we need to prioritize? And streets are public land, it's public space. Mm -hmm. So what are we will, what do we want to prioritize the use of that public space to be? Right? And if we have, if we have to deal with garbage as a public, you know, as a civic 
responsibility and as part of our public space because we all produce it, then that's something that has to be baked into how how do we design our city? And and it's definitely infrastructure. Anyways, mm -hmm. I'll off my soapbox, but thank you. Yes, no, thank you. I was I was married to a man from England for decades. So hence my experience there. Uh, and first let me go to the person who's an attendee. And is it Emil? Emily. Could you unmute them, Lucian? Oh. Where is, you can, is it me? I know, tell me how you pronounce your name properly. No, oh. oh, Emily Yushin. Emily Yushin. Uh, uh, oh, okay, that's easy. Well, I have Thank you. Emily Yushin, yeah. I U E X I M. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I find a congestion issue CB1 has been greatly improved uh, during the last few years. And with the air quality issue, I really think it's uh, perhaps it's an extension of 9-11 uh, bombing. We have been trying to improve air quality in CB1. Uh, and in the vicinity area for decades. So uh, the rest of the other issues, I I pretty much agree with Rosa, as well as the goal is good, but in regards to CB1, I think it's uh, not the most emergent emergently pertinent all right sure other things uh, but i do agree that we need to have a comprehensive good plan for our city and i also find interesting to have heard about tammy talking about people with those cars parking uh, mm -hmm. then or into uh, public transit to get city to work. Uh, I need to research more on these issues. Perhaps all of you could, you know, enlighten me, enlightening me more on those issues. Well, not just me and or civilians in our neighborhoods. Thank you. Sure. You want, I'm sorry. I just want to clarify. You want more information on the parking and driving it? Or the parking travel. Take mass transit. Yeah, it was. Uh, I found it's a very interesting issue, and I actually have been. I have lived in the city for thirty three years, and I think CB one was uh, more or less. I get uh, gets my attention is really after. 9-11 uh, bombing. Prior to that, I was more involved in CB3 as a mentor for my graduate research. Uh, I personally lived in other uh, Upper West Side for over 30 years, and then I also I have relatives lived in Manhattan for a century, or at least 1.5 centuries. So. Uh, so I, I, I find lots of issues very interesting and thank you all of you to have brought out a lot of interesting things for me to consider in a, in a different perspective. So, uh, but for whatever Tammy brought out, those issues I found it's, it's, you know, those are very good points that how we make our city, especially <laughs> this uh, window of the world. Manhattan is like the window of, not just the window of world, it's a window for uh, icon iconic capitalist uh, society. Uh, I think the number one cap 
almost used to be the number one capitalist country uh, in the whole world. Now it's like uh, becoming more and more not like it used to be. It's a little disappointing, but I'm sure someday we will bring it back. But uh, uh, but I think uh, COVID issue is good and bad. Bad for our civilians' health. Good for a lot of congestion issue be resolved. Uh, but I think it, it's not going to be like that forever. I think it's temporary situation. So we do need to consider about a lot of congestion issue. And also, also I think I also agree with Tammy about we need to, you know. Every CD board should focus on the, their own uh, communities. Uh, and then, of course, it's how we make our Manhattan great first. And then we'll, of course, implementing and thinking about other issues. Yeah. Well, thank you. Mm. Thank you. And Rosa, your hand's still up or? Down. Okay, then Tammy, if you'd like to finish up for us. Uh, thank you. And it's been a really great conversation. So thanks a lot. One of the things I want to point out for is, as you've reminded all of us, congestion pricing already does exist in the taxis, which um, is not abating, but that also goes to something that I think New York City did a little smarter than London because the mini cabs and the taxis in London do not pay congestion pricing, which has been one of the major components of issues that they have. Um, but I do think that what we really want is to be more forward thinking. And if we're gonna be talking about exemptions, I'd rather give somebody who's driving an electric truck an electric car, um, an electric minivan for carpool versus an individual driver coming into the zone, some kind of incentive. Because we've long said, you know, we would love to be the city that had an all electric ferry system. Wouldn't that be great to help? The environmental impact there. If we're only charging people money and we're not incentivizing them to think smarter and drive smarter, it won't make as great of an impact for long term change. I think of, you know, the goal that General Motors has to turn every vehicle electric in their in their entire thing. Well, if we had less cars and they were all electric, if there were less trucks or even the same amount of trucks and they were all electric, how much better would that be? You know, why can't we figure out a way to get garbage trucks that are more environmentally friendly and just kind of roll down the road to include that in our conversations that um, look forward to 30, 40 years, what the possibility is, you know, would you've got people on bikes, scooters, carpooling, and mass transit. But even with the mass transit exists, you know, should they be all electric buses? I would say yes, of course. Should, you know, all the businesses, you know, be incentivized to be able to use green energy trucking systems? Yeah, that'd be great. And how do we incorporate that within this program? So that's my closing statement. And thank you for bringing the topic up. Yeah, so we'll continue on and I'll look this over. We'll have some topics for, we have some speakers to give some topics. And then I guess we move on to some of the exemptions and some of the street uses. We can look at, because again, these things probably do dovetail into each other, but we do need to get a resolution together with some of our positions and there were some that were pretty unanimous tonight, so I can, I'll put some of those together to make sure people still agree and we can move on from there, the things we want to opine on. So thank you, everybody.
Thank you, Betty and Michael for moderating. Yeah, thank you, Betty. This was a great conversation. Um, thank you. And Tammy, I will send you an, an article about electric buses and you'll see the challenge. Because it's kind of interesting and it came out in 2020, so it's it's interesting and it's a lot of the problems in lower Manhattan specifically. Betty, if you're able to, you had mentioned that London was having some issues and was looking to Stockholm for solutions. I would love to uh, see that article or, or anything that you were referencing there. That's interesting. Okay, I'll tell you, I will talk to, uh, in fact, if you want, I will talk to Lucian in general, because a lot of people brought up different things, such as the 2025, and uh, to see if we can create a link at the community board where we can put in a lot of these things, the links to go to them and a brief discussion of what they are. So that people can go look for what they want and get it. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And like Rosa said, I highly recommend anyone look at that transportation alternatives. It's yep. it's 25 by 2025. I think that so it's 25 by 25 is their tagline. Uh, but they've got a nice little video that is uh I don't know. Hard is it, send it out to everybody. It is, and I can give you the City of London uh, project too. It's it's interesting. But yes, no, we'll work on putting some of those things together. So if people have ideas of interesting alternatives tried in different countries, by all means, yes. send them and we'll start collecting some of that so people can go look at it. I think that also includes with the staging. Like Mitch was saying, you know, how do we, they're such poor stewards of the financial, you know, for what they have already. So. How can you ensure that mass transit would be improved based on them just collecting money? Uh, <laughs> let let the government get, a, get a, give us a world class mass transit system, clean, safe, and efficient. The people will come. Congestion will go down, and you know it's we have to put you know like uh, the, I don't know if it's the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken, but uh, something like that. Well, there's going to be a lot too, because if they start to give lower priority to children in our school zone to go to schools in our zone, for instance, it portends there's going to be a bigger movement of school children in general around the city. You know, so how do we handle those to make it safe for them if they choose to bike, if they want to go on mass transit? I mean, how do we? We have a whole age group there that we really want to look at and give them options. You know, if if I if I was the the parent of a twelve or thirteen year old and I lived in the North Bronx and my kid was going to school in Lower Manhattan, I would not let them bike for safety reasons from there to to, to their school, like at at six seven o'clock in the morning, maybe coming back at four five six o'clock at night, depending on after school programs. I mean, we're, we're looking at this like you know. Like I said, everybody doesn't live in Chelsea and could bike and work in the financial district. There's so there's so many other families and situations that I think we can't just lump everything in one group. Just let like let the government build, uh, 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 put money in infrastructure, and the better the transit system and safer and more efficient, people will be going there because nobody wants to drive in traffic. Nobody wants to you know, get behind the car if they don't have to. No, and I agree, uh, but there has to be a general push to the MTA to think of some of these constituencies, I, yes, as is. well as the cost and all of that for equity. How can they, no, these children afford to go where they need 100%, to go? 100%, 100%. I, 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 you know, I, I agree with you uh, because then, then you also have people that let's say somebody that might live out in, I'm just picking neighborhoods somewhere like in, in, in Jamaica Estates or somebody that might live in, in the Rockaways or in Howard Beach or Bensonhurst and they work out in Jersey and the only way they can get to work and come back late at night or, or depending on what the shift is, they have to go and they have to come across the Manhattan Bridge and then to get to the Holland Tunnel. But so they're entering the zone, but, you know, they're not really like uh, they're not congest you know you know they're not staying in the zone you know like that's that's the only way that they have to i i you know i've no i know people that that lived in brooklyn worked far out in new jersey where they could not take public transportation because of of the logistics of where these places were and uh just well, you, know, you know build build it have have the transit system like japan and everybody will want to live on that 
Well, there you go. Now, what will happen is basically this is going to force a lot of people to move around and, and, and either change their jobs or change where they live. Right. But everybody that doesn't have the of being able to change, adjust it. I wish that was true. Everybody no, doesn't but have, don't have the luxury. No, you, we, it will displace a lot of people is what I see. But real, real um, quick, some Betty. will, some yeah. won't. Excuse me, Lucian. Yeah, just uh, just one um, point of information. Um, with the with the, the current law, if you are traveling on the outer highways of Manhattan, you do not have to pay the congestion charge. But you can't. So get, if if you, you can't do what Mitch said without that, that's not 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 the uh, the situation that I had just mentioned to you, Lucian. Well, if if but if a person wanted to. Instead, let's say they could take from Brooklyn instead of going over the bridge and coming to Manhattan, mm -hmm. they instead went to the George Washington Bridge. Well, yeah, well, yeah and adding so much to their trip. I mean, you know, like, the, a couple of years ago, Pat Moore might remember this. Somebody came from, I forget which uh, agency, DOT, or whatever, they were trying to cut out some bus service that connected like went like i think it was the m the 22 that connected like battery park city it came across low manhattan mm -hmm. went to chinatown and it went up like the the, the, the lower east side right. and and it didn't serve a high population but the population it served were seniors yes. poor, other people and we fought to keep that and their answer was well, they, you know, there's other ways to do it. You can go up like to like, like 96th street and then come back across and then, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but it yeah. was like, you know, yeah, I, I can go to, uh, to California by first flying like across the, uh, uh, Atlantic ocean and then continuing past then the Pacific ocean to, to come from the Asia to California. But it, Mitch, it's, Mitch, 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 isn't this, but isn't it precisely uh, just, just from a, for the sake of argument. Yes, sir. Isn't it precisely the type of traffic that you want to take off the streets of Manhattan of people of course, coming through? Of course, but I, what I'm saying is that as the better the tr the empty, I, I agree with the goals that Betty put down. I'm just disagreeing with the mechanism of putting the expense on us. And I don't mean like a CB, I'm just like us, our citizens, because I'm, I'm putting the, that on the government. Be, and the, 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 the better congestion is, I mean, you know, the less congestion is, the better for everybody, um, um, of course, but the better for everybody, but hey, Mitch, yes, do you yeah. remember what the solution for that bus was? Yes, I, well, I, yes, I do. I, I was, in fact, I was a, a, a public member. And that was one of the things that I fought for because I used to go to China, walk to Chinatown to do my shopping. Okay. Do you remember what, what, the, the what the solution was? They, they, they kept the 22 bus. And they made what changes? That they eliminated, they eliminated bus. The changes that have been made in the bus systems that service lower Manhattan include bypassing some of the stops okay. due to the overwhelming congestion going towards the Holland Tunnel. So if we can lower the congestion towards Holland Tunnel, we can actually improve the bus no, service. No, 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 but, but what I'm saying to, to answer what Lucian said, yes, there are there are some people that can take another route. But there are some people that like if it. they went around like 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 to the up to the George Washington Bridge to go back down to to, to, to the outskirts of Newark when they live like like when, when it's around a, a 20 minute ride from the Holland Tunnel, that's not right. No, it's not right. But again, Mitch, what's going to end up happening is it's going to inconvenience. I mean, what, what the position here is it's going to inconvenience some people, most likely middle class people who are not poor enough to be in that in that article that Betty put around. You have to have less than sixty thousand dollars of income to to qualify for paying less. No, or, not paying. You get a tax credit, which wouldn't a help. Tax credit. So you pay the full amount, but you get a tax credit. Right. The legislation. It's going to force. It's going to force the middle class. Out of the, out of the area, so, that and that, the taxes. That tax credit thing is a scam. Sorry, I'm late, guys. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's a bunch I of. Taxes. Had a family thing. I'm sorry. I apologize for being late, but it is a few words. I think most of you know my position on this issue. Uh, and that, yeah, that yeah yeah the tax credit thing is just a scam. It, yep. uh, it hurts small businesses, and you write about the middle class. Yeah. Uh, and and Mitch, you know, you made some you made great points. You hit the nail on the head with a lot of stuff, um, especially using that bus route as an analogy. It's just a bunch of bean counters in this some case, just looking at, well, there's not enough money made here. There's not enough people using it. That's the whole point of the mass transit is that it's used for all the people just because yeah. there's not enough, according to some idiot in MTA. 
who's uh, you know counting some um uh you know like i said bean counting some chart that he sees figures on it's never probably even been on in his whole life and then people have to suffer for it and then when you have like advocates uh using phrases uh, uh such as if you drive your car into the city you're a bad citizen quote unquote or at one of the hearings one of the politicians says why should you, your ride should not be necessary who the hell is it you to decide thank to you tell me what ri ride is necessary and unnecessary yeah. you know particularly when you have a chauffeur so so yeah. you have these, these advocates and 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 people who who um particularly the radical transportation alternatives that would be happy to have not a single car in Manhattan and have 90 year old women having to go to going to a doctor should be riding a bicycle. And if they're not, they're scorned for it. This is this is their this is their attitude. And, and you see you see you see creep out now and then when they, you know, pretending that, that they don't have these radical views. Um, so uh, Congestion pricing. Uh, the reason for it, MTA is is basically just a corrupt agency that is dysfunctional. Uh, is clueless about how to spend money, how to save it, how to use it. Just waste, waste, waste. So give us more money, and the burden should not be on on uh, people who drive. Get their yeah, house in order. Just the get, their, get their house in order, and it's going to hurt small businesses. And, yeah. and yeah, you're right; it's going to completely change the dynamic of the city. Um, and, and it's, so it's like uh, in that. We'll get that movie. But uh, if you want to. Uh, Get take an airline to Los Angeles, and you want to use an airline that that was never in an accident. There's yeah. only one. It want this, so you have to fly to Australia first okay. to get to Los Angeles if that's what you want to do. So there's yep. roundabout ways. I don't care. There's no equity here. It's no. not about equity. I'm, you know, that's a bunch of BS. Equity. It's uh, about forcing people who cannot afford to pay the twelve dollars a day to mm -hmm. move their cars around, or the twenty-five dollars a day to, to pay a cab to go around. So the people who are rich are not going to be bothered by this because they're still going to do oh, what they're going to do. It's the poor exactly. people and it's the middle class people who are going to be hurt, and they're the ones who are going to drive around like Mitch is saying, or not take those jobs, or switch jobs, right. or leave. Yeah, or move, or move like everyone's moving. And the ones who advocate for this are these are these uh, well-funded yep. advocacy groups yep. and, and these uh, politicians who are scared of them and just kowtowing or cowards. Uh, this, and like I said, I was at every hearing, just about, I think I missed one hearing when they, uh, public hearing when they had this, and and every every group that, that was well-organized, transportation alternatives, and every other alphabet city yeah. group uh, was in favor of this for their own selfish reasons. But citizens that came out, individual citizens, they'd say nine out of 10 were opposed. And even people that didn't have cars, and yeah. they said it up front, were opposed to this. Okay. So this Mark, is just- Mark, and, Mark, 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 Mark. Uh, can I please finish, Tammy? I know it was a little you late. You missed a large part politics. of the meeting. And so I it understand. would be good if you heard that this is a continuing dialogue. I Don't understand. shoot all your wad tonight. There uh, are positive things that we can do and discuss in relation to this. Right, so one I hear last where you're thing going. Is, uh, re residents below 60, because they're going to implement it or not. If it happens, God hope it doesn't. But they should be exempt, period. Just period, exempt. 100%. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Tammy, can, can I just, I wanted to just say one thing about the 22 bus that, that you brought up that yes, you are correct. I just want to just for, for a timeline so some people that weren't there are not confused. When we saved the M22 bus, it wasn't like, okay, like at that point, nothing else happened. We were just saving that bus. It wasn't like, well, we're going to save the bus and now we're going to lose these other stops. Those things came a few years later that was totally unrelated to the decision that we did our only reason for saving that bus was to help some of the poor people that have to go between the Lower East Side, Chinatown, and and like towards the Battery Park City, and and it had nothing to do with the uh, uh, the, 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 the the decisions to 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 change some of those other stops. Uh, that was something later that was unfortunate that happened, but it wasn't part of the decision when we saved the 22. Right, that's correct. Yep. And those stops will not come back, probably. Right, and 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 you know something, I'm against. But you know what? I think we can all agree that we'd love to see more electric vehicles. Of course, less Tam. placards, 
less double parkers. Yep. It'd be great to have city workers take mass transit and not get carve out. Of course. So they get a After double buses. bonus. I think there are so many places that we've already found consensus on. But let's try and focus on some of the good things that we can carve out of this and put that together. Yes, there's going to be things that we don't want, but you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater because it is part of what the national dialogue in this country is. Whether yes. we as an individual like it or not, it is a major push. Mm -hmm. What we can do is make sure that it works for what we can do in CB1. And that's how I started my comment. And that's going to be my last comment tonight because I'm going to go eat dinner. Yes, and that was a very wise one. So thank you. I'm not so sure we have to say we accept it just because it's it's the law. We could always still be advocating that it be overturned. Exactly. Uh, so uh, just because I didn't it's, say uh, accept it, Mark. Yeah. I said there are parts of it that are good. There are what's parts good, of it though? that are not. I don't know what's good about it. Yeah, but. I don't know what's good about it either. The goal of of improving mass transit that's good. The goal of reducing congestion is good. The goal of of improving air quality is good. This is not a equitable in which to do it. Yeah, I agree. It's just throwing money at the MTA to waste again. That's all it's doing. It's, it's not Mark, going to change anything. Mark, before you really? came, I, I, we, we, like I just said that I felt that, and I think a few other people agreed, while we, while I agree with, we agree with the goals of improving, you know, mass transit, reducing congestion, and improving air quality, the burden should fall on the government to, to support those programs as opposed to like taxing the individual citizens, so, like which, so so. Uh, well, could we tax myself, bitch. Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah, well, they're all taxed too. The burden is focused on the people below 60th Street, and the burden, the the benefit is to everybody else, and and it's really very frustrating to be one of the people below 60th Street, as whether I'm gonna, I mean, unless I can walk, or bike. Because I'm not going to ride the subway anytime soon with this pandemic. So the by, so subway's out. Buses are out. It's going to be a year, two years, three years. So basically, the only way I can get around is by my own physical mobility. That's not fair. Yeah. yeah. And, and You're uh, telling somebody with a disability, right? Okay. Yes. But I, that's what I'm saying. I yes. Question. With a disability. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Eddie, before, like, I know that Rosa was, Rosa said before that, you know, about the social distancing six feet apart. Like I said, unfortunately, I have to take the trains and the buses all the time. And my daughter in law does daily. Feet, you, know, you can't even get one or two feet or, or like away from somebody, and we're not even near capacity now. So uh, I, I, I agree with, with social distancing and science and everything like that, but right now that's impossible. Uh, and get a vaccine. I, I'm I'm sorry. Well, actually, well, I I got my second dose uh, last week. Yeah, no, me too. I mean, getting the vaccine, but that's not going to stop it. I'm not going to. It's not. Mm. So so better. You can come within six feet of me now. <laughs> so can, do you mind if I ask a, a question about? Um, so it seems like what we we also agreed on when we were talking earlier about um, the traffic from Brooklyn to the Holland Tunnel. In the Holland Tunnel to Brooklyn, is that there's deficiencies in the roadways. Um, what did you say? Let me say it again. There's deficiencies in our roadways, right? Like our our roads aren't able to handle some of the like I don't I don't know like okay so I'm from Texas and we have a lot of flyovers which turn into icy scary things you know when it gets cold obviously like a few weeks ago, but um, it just kind of seems like if we had you know. Some sort of solution that could fix the problem where, like, these cars that are going through town don't like a tunnel, be... maybe a tunnel from the Manhattan Bridge to the Holland Tunnel, yeah, or, or something like over a bridge, like you're saying. Is that, is that I can't 100 percent a new idea? Like, that's that where the government infrastructure should come in. Like, how come it is the way it is? Like, why is it that you have to drive down Canal Street when really I would much rather just be shopping on Canal Street, right? Like. How because these things were built like a hundred over a hundred years ago when yeah. like 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 the other side of the Manhattan Bridge was like the suburbs and yeah. Bronx was farmland. Like we've we've had a hundred years to fix it, right? Like why what is you know, it just it just yeah. seems like a thing that maybe could be um addressed and could be like one of the three goals, if it could be the fourth secret goal 
of like kind of like maybe fixing some of the roads too because the congestion isn't just because there's a lot of cars i mean obviously that is what congestion is but like you know if, if i had a deviated septum i would try to get it fixed right like if we sorry that's a gross analogy but you know what i mean like the plumbing isn't quite working either right. well the cross branch is you really bring up a perfect point exactly perfect point in that it's been a hundred years and there's been billions and billions and billions of dollars spent and it doesn't go anywhere to actually fix anything. How about put having a simple thing like roving patrols get rid of the Uber cars that double park with their fingers up their ass for an hour and causing uh, backups for, you know, eight blocks, just one car and nothing happens. And well, actually there you know, is a like that, just simple things like that. Would, would would go a long way, but the city doesn't do it. They just have you know four traffic agents on one intersection, three of them on the phone, and one of them uh, maybe doing something. So there's, well, there's actually, no willingness, there's, there's no leadership, there's no willingness, there's no efficiency. There's, there's, oh, but there's a do it. There's a bill that might interest you, mm -hmm. and there's one where Uber and those other ride shares will pay for the time when they're empty which will really hurt them and actually make, it'll reduce the number simply because they're going to have to stay but busy or they're paying to be pass the cost on. They'll figure out a way to scam it. But they have but all to the, make it more yeah. expensive. You're exactly right. Yeah. I don't think that's fair because these people actually earn their living doing that. Yes, I agree with what you were saying, Mark, 100%, because that is, <laughs> that is why we're drowning. This was not the biggest problem until we had Uber and all these, all these other, it, it is exacerbated by all these rideshare people. Yeah, I drive all the time before Uber. And even before that, there was always a lot of congestion and a lot of traffic, but but there was a at least a, a somewhat of a flow to it, to to the movement. Oh, uh, remember, Mark, it's because the taxis had taxi stands, so you knew right. where to go. You could hail on the street. Right. There's no such thing. And you know, the right. the four hire vehicles stop everywhere and anywhere. It's exactly. And, and then the they cruise. Yeah. They don't have a parking spot. They Even cruise. taxis, when they could be a pain in the ass sometimes, pardon me. But at least they, they're quick. They drop off, they pick up, pick up, drop off. They might cut over three lanes to get something and do all sorts of crazy stuff. But it's it's quick, quick. They're not just sitting around. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it'd be great if they could put Uber stands somewhere. But the thing is, they don't care. They want to pick up their, their fare right where the person is standing with the stupid uh, smartphone. And they, they'll never pull over, like, down the street so people can get by. They don't care. They'll sit on a one-lane street, uh, load the luggage. They don't care. And and that's that's a major problem. That, and that all adds up. And, and, you know, it's like the telephone game connects all the way down to where, you know, five, six, ten blocks. B Betty, well, kind of like, you know something? I was almost being facetious when, but in when Mimi made the comment about, you know, the infrastructure in, in Texas, you know, Probably a tunnel from the, the the Manhattan Bridge to the Holland Tunnel because of all the pipes and everything is not doable. But you know, like an overpass where the only people that are going into the tunnel, you know, like like uh, from from you know some a structure maybe it takes ten or twenty years to to build or something like that. But some of those things might be a, a forward way of thinking of building some overpasses or underpasses to bypass like local traffic for for like the you know cars and trucks or trucks that have to go like like from you know the, the a bridge to 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 uh, the Holland tunnel the Lincoln tunnel or the uh, you know how like at the port authority the buses from port authority bypass local traffic and they kind of go on like there's an overpass and they go right into the Lincoln tunnel like something like that I think would help congestion immeasurably. And that might be something, uh, you know, to uh, put on the docket. And that's something that is, you know, I think is something that's a, a government responsibility, but I think those ideas that we could be really helpful with that. And it would be a good job creating thing, right? 100%. Although so, so there was a like waiting for what Pete Buttigieg has to say. Get more shopping because areas. There was actually a proposal by Robert Moses ages and ages ago. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, the lower the lower Manhattan Expressway. Yes, yeah. and that was there was a proposal by Robert Moses ages and ages ago that was you know fought against and won by Jane Jacobs. Jacobs. And uh, the reason why um, people were against it was because it would absolutely kill the neighborhoods that it went mm -hmm. through. And I think that that fact would still be relevant today. 
It would be, and that's what I said. I think people oh, yeah. judge would be very against it, and we need federal. Yeah, no, yeah, no eminent domain. Right. We're going to tear down neighborhoods. That was a ridiculous proposal. It would have to be done. horrible. I it would miss have to what's be done it. above, maybe. Does 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 Rosie remember like what Robert Moses it's did to the Bronx? Here, right, it has to touch down to the ground, and that's where you're talking about killing the neighborhood. And think about what the FDR does to the city in like Fida and South Street Seaport, and how it separates it from the water, right? But you're talking about that literally slicing through the city, that would just kill everywhere, and then it would basically divide the neighborhoods on either side. I think that's basically like an urban death knell, frankly. It, doesn't Canal Street opinion. already do that? How is that different from like Canal Street? I don't want to cross like okay. that foot. Uh, Mimi, I, Rosa, you remember that's what Robert Moses did and destroyed half the Bronx. Robert but Moses, we're talk, the, we're right. theoretically the across by the cross Bronx Expressway. That, that, this is documented. It's not, you know, just like, and I'm from the Bronx, you know, and my, fam my family's lived on both sides. Sheridan. It, 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 it created, uh, uh, you know, different classes of people. It created barrios. It created, you know, like, like, like both good and, and, and bad. It was, it was, a, it was a major source of urban blight when, uh, I mean, I, I, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, I'm sorry, but it, it's, uh, it was something that really like uh, cut the Bronx in half and created some really poor conditions. Yeah, it was an unintended consequence. Because the goal was they just looked at it from a pure engineering perspective about well, how can we get cars moving better and less congestion. And but but you, you know you put these highways and roads in in the middle of neighborhoods and and and. and uh, and this is what this is the consequence. And the, the traffic on the Cross Bronx Expressway in my lifetime has not improved. <laughs> I had to be on there the other day. That'll, have, that'll never improve. Then we go back. Yeah, to it, it introduced an interesting. Uh, I would I recommend looking at the concept of induced demand. The a lot of the expressways that Robert Moses and the bridge crossings that he put up uh, kind of taught all transportation experts that counterintuitively, the more lanes, the more space that they they expanded to cars it only just made the congestion worse because it actually attracts more cars into the open space so yeah, but that's michael that wasn't the reason why the cross bronx expressway cut the bronx in half oh that's no i completely agree yes there was other <laughs> yeah there's there are plenty of faults to the plan i mean, I mean sometimes there are unintended consequences you know but uh uh anyway he's also uh, the same one who decided that putting all the roads along the waterway was the smart idea, thus permanently ensuring that Manhattan is one of the largest islands with the least amount of interaction with the water. Also it's true. Bizarre to think. So he would he not be my the bridge and through the battery. <laughs> I had yeah. these complaints in the 1950s and things haven't gotten yeah. any better. Moses is, a, is it, is it good? It was good and bad with Moses. So okay, things things are let's uh, we'll be positive and uh, we have an, uh, a new administration and uh, hopefully things will be a little better. This has been a very a interesting foray into what Robert Moses and an urban renewal and eminent domain uh, in this committee. So thank you for that. I was un unexpected Robert Moses discussion. Hey, I grew up in the Bronx. Yes, yeah, so we'll move forward on making it better and. And I do think that the Robert Moses discussion, as funny as it might be, will come up again because the resiliency plans, if you um, that are being discussed with LMCR, need to have a transportation change dialogue associated with it. So it may be a point that the entire transportation committee is asked to come um, specifically take a look at the open houses so you can see Michael Francor was at one of them and added, you know, added a lot of value to asking the questions of why, what is being done at the FDR, why is no on-land option, and how is that working? Um, so more interaction with the dialogue there will help dramatically change the FIDI seaport area and could also potentially add to solving some of our congestion issues. Well, and it closed a couple of exits, exits on the FDR permanently, which doesn't, it doesn't help either. Tammy, yeah. uh, as we get closer to the Jetsons, as we get closer to the Jetsons, that will solve the congestion on the on the on land. Well, and keep in mind, Polly Trottenberg was moving toward getting uh, ferries or some kind of 
freight vessel that would deliver versus trucks into the area and then have cargo bikes or something smaller trucks that then distribute from them inland into Manhattan. So you don't have these large trucks coming in. Nobody knows the Jetsons. Yeah. I heard Simon's been talking yes, about the truck thing's been talked about for years. They just it, the city just needs to eventually just put a ban on on length of trucks. So you'd have either have uh, you know two deliveries or, or 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 more frequent deliveries, but there would be uh, uh, you know less uh, less eighteen wheelers, uh, which you know block intersections all the time. Uh, Mark, you know, I have something to tell you. Yeah. This is not good news for you. Uh, we were talking before you arrived about the various rule changes that are coming away, and one of them being done this fiscal year, so it's probably done already, is to meet the federal standards that widens the trucks that are allowed. So the trucks can be wider now in the city? Yes. Uh, uh, oh, we have to address I, that and that uh, maybe the I, city can have its own rules about what's allowed on the streets in certain <laughs> in certain sections meant boroughs. Well, I think it would definitely go into the dialogue that Betty will need to have here with everybody because there are uh, specific truck routes that go through lower Manhattan. Some streets are uh, tour bus eligible, others are not. And if that is a goal in terms of widening of the trucks, then that's going to have to go part and parcel to streets because I'm just saying picture you know an extra double wide trying to make it up or down south william that'll be a charming one well, but, by the way, they never, all these truck routes that uh, that are posted as no trucks allowed they, they these rules are never followed by anything even the city they never it's just and there's, there's no enforcement either so but no it's another one of the rules that i has has my attention from this year that we really do need to Put in some comments in that 30 day period. Although there's maybe nothing we can do if they're just aligning with the federal rules. You, you bring uh, the point that you bring up about the widening trucks. I'm, I'm going to take a, a stab guess that this was a, a lobbyist uh, influential uh, uh, thing that, that uh, the trucking industry and, and freighters and all this whatever probably wanted this to, to happen. And that's something we're up against as well. Just like with the congestion pricing, it's it's special interest that overwhelm common sense of all the good ideas that were brought up by everyone today and corruption. So that's why nothing ever gets done. Uh, yeah, no, something needs to be said, but like I said, yeah, I think this one's gonna be a real uphill. But the rules are important and a lot of them are changing and it's yeah about time we figure out that we find out about them before they close the period where you can make comments. But anyway, everybody ready to move on to dinner and. Yes. <laughs> Then maybe we should Lucian. Uh, ah, in fact, it's number four. It's updating the truck width limits. They're changing the traffic rules to reflect changes in the trucking industry. The trucking industry has adopted standard widths of 102 inches, while the current traffic rules allow truck widths of 96 inches. They want to provide consistency with the current truck industry width standards, and so they want to change the city charter. Hmm. That, to me, that's an, a recipe for even more uh, bicycle accidents, yes. uh, for blind spots. Yeah, well, I mean, everybody's going to be small compared to them. Yeah, and they, I mean, and their ideas because they're trying not to interfere with interstate commerce because the trucks would have to unload and load to different smaller trucks to get through New York City. And is it all of New York City or just Manhattan, um, Betty? Uh, this is the DOT, so it would be all of the whole city. You know what? That's that, that's another good argument for some of those overpasses to go from like the, the uh, Manhattan Bridge to the Holland Tunnel. 
or the Midtown Tunnel, or, the, or, or like the uh, coming across the 59th Street Bridge to get to the Lincoln Tunnel and have some overpasses. Maybe it's the, it's the city of the future where the the, the trucks, you know, because they're basically going from like like yeah. like north to south or east to west, and they're just passing through our our our, our, our neighborhoods. So, uh, you know, I mean, that truck like that would take up two lanes in the tunnel. And can you imagine if it got stuck? Stuck? Oh God! There's well, no the other way around. <laughs> Uh, rule number three that stuck, they're changing you know? is they're going to amend the truck routes as well. Okay. They're changing enforcement, the enforcement, truck, enforcement. Well, they're changing truck routes citywide. <laughs> yeah, they're all going to go through Battery Park City now. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. Do we know where it's going to go though? Like, will that help our congestion? Will that take away from the pricing of the congestion pricing? I will that take away the Tammy's money? comment of wider trucks and then putting them in more location you know are they limiting the number of truck routes because the width is going to be greater or are they increasing the number of truck I, I don't know that's what we're trying to get information and why lucian had said he's going to move more on this just since we've kind of learned about these things out there and it faces all departments so for those of you on other committees this is not just a dot issue this is all city Departments have to put forward their rule changes for the year, and then there's a, a a period when you can respond to them as a committee as a community member. And so we asked, do this does it come to community boards? And the answer was, uh, no. so we're going to try to change that. But anyway, that's all I know. And any ideas you have, let me know. CC Lucian about things you want posted, things for people to read. And then hopefully we can give you a link at some point where you can go look and see what's out there to get information about various things people have mentioned during these discussions. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yes, well, thank you all. Thanks everyone, have a good night. All right. Thank yeah, you. I'm gonna cut the recording now. Okay. Sorry, sorry, I was late, guys. Thank you. Thanks for letting me.